Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all back to this edition of the HNRCA Monday Seminar Series. As we return from the Thanksgiving holidays, I hope everyone had a great holiday break. I'm uh, not Cy Das, I'm Roger Fielding, the Associate Center Director here at the HNRCA. And on behalf of the USDA HNRCA and the Seminar Committee, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sarah Espinoza, a physician scientist. Sarah received her MD from the University of Virginia School of Medicine and, a and completed a clinical fellowship in geriatric medicine and gerontology at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Espinoza is a professor and associate chief for research and serves as the Director of Clinical Programs for the San Antonio Geriatrics Research Education and Clinical Center. In this role, she directs clinical activities within the GREC, including clinical demonstration products, projects, and clinical research activities. Dr. Espinosa has been highly engaged in the growth of clinical research in aging and geriatrics within the San Antonio GREC as well as teaching of medical students, residents, and fellows. Dr. Espinoza is an internist geriatrician within the Department of Medicine, Division of Geriatrics, and a member of the Sam and Ann Barshop Institute for Longevity and Aging Studies. Her research, which we're looking to, forward to hearing about today, focuses on the understanding of the geriatric syndrome frailty through epidemiologic and clinical translational research. The title of her presentation today is Clinical Trials to Identify Interventions for Frailty and Sarcopenic Obesity in Older Adults. Welcome, Dr. Espinoza. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna share my slides here. Um, one moment. Okay, is that projecting okay? Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, that kind introduction and also for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I um, am, as you mentioned, a researcher at the Barshop Institute, which you're seeing here, which is our new building that was opened a little over a year ago. Um, in the medical center. And we have in this building a clinical research unit as well as uh, lab space. And uh, my lab is here. So uh, we also have a pepper center where we do a lot of uh, these clinical translational uh, clinical trials uh, with the focus on improving health span for older adults. Um, and today, what I would like to speak with you about is uh, frailty. So we're going to do a brief overview of frailty, talk about the role of obesity and insulin resistance in the development of frailty. And then I'm gonna give you a overview of the study design of a clinical trial that I am currently uh, leading of metformin for prevention of frailty. And then at the end, um, share with you some pilot data that we have uh, using intranasal oxytocin for the treatment of sarcopenic obesity in older adults. Um, so I'd like to start with um, basically how I got interested in research in general, but also in frailty. Um, and I start kind of with this clinical picture because it's really how my interest in frailty began as a medicine resident um, at University of Rochester, um, 
I became kind of interested and intrigued by, I guess, my clinical recognition of frail older adults. And I wondered <clears throat> how is it that, you know, pretty uh, soon into my residency, I can kind of just basically look at an older patient and identify them as frail and kind of know that this person was going to have a lot of complications um, during their hospital stay is when I first recognized it, but also in clinic kind of trying to take care of these older patients that are highly vulnerable to decline. And um, from there, um, actually my mentor at the time was Bill Hall, uh, who's a, a well-known geriatrician. And he suggested that I go to Hopkins for my fellowship, which I did. And then I had the um, great fortune to work with Linda Freed and Jeremy Walston to kind of study frailty further. And then as I'm gonna show you, or discuss in the next several slides how I became interested in the role of obesity in this syndrome. But first, what is frailty? Um, frailty is really considered a clinical geriatric syndrome that people who are frail um, are highly vulnerable and have very poor tolerance to stress. Um, so any stressor that would, for a robust older adult, um, result in maybe a small decline for a short period of time, and they're back to their baseline fairly quickly. In frail people, even a small uh, stressor can result in a spiral of decline and uh, complications. Uh, and even if, let's say for instance, they have an acute illness and causes them to decline, and then they improve somewhat or recover from that acute illness, they never quite make it back to their prior baseline and then usually have further complications and decline. How I recognized it, I guess, um, clinically as a resident is these are the patients that when they were on my service in the uh, inpatient unit, they just had one complication after the other, be it, um, you know, maybe acute kidney injury while they were there, they fell, maybe became delirious, um, all sorts of, you know, infections and what have you. And then usually they needed more help and support to be discharged than they needed actually when they came into the hospital. Um, and these people um, are known to have high risk, people who are frail for many poor outcomes. So falls, becoming hospitalized repeatedly usually. These are kind of oftentimes the frequent flyers to the hospital, uh, disability, worsening disability, and of course, mortality. And uh, Linda Freed and Jeremy Walston and their colleagues um, really kind of were some of the leaders in the uh, field of frailty. And they conceptualized that frailty was sort of a cycle of, um, issues that are primarily uh, initiated by aging, senescence, disease, which leads to sarcopenia kind of at, at the start of the cycle, which leads to um, slow gait speed, low physical activity, undernutrition, and this kind of one thing kind of begets another and then you enter into a cycle, cycle of frailty where it's kind of very difficult to kind of break out of this cycle once it begins once it begins. So this was sort of the first, I guess, conceptualization model that they put forward, which was later um, tested and operationalized using data from the cardiovascular health study. And um, they kind of retrospectively looked at the cardiovascular health study at the older component of this cohort, um, 65 and older, and used data that had been collected previously to devise a phenotype model where the presence of three out of these five characteristics were um, indicative of frailty. So <clears throat> some of these were um, measured from questionnaires such as um, unintentional weight loss of 10 pounds or more in the prior year, self-reported exhaustion using items from a depression scale, low physical activity using the Minnesota Leisure Time Physical Activity Questionnaire, and then two um, measures of function 
uh, hand grip strength and slow gait speed. And in this la really landmark, landmark paper, they um, established cut points for slowness and uh, weakness. And so again, as I mentioned, three or more considered frail, one or two was considered intermediate or pre-frail, and then uh, zero is non-frail. And uh, in these uh, survival analyses, they show that uh, individuals who were not frail with the solid black line had uh, better survival over a period of about eight years and a little over 5,000 older adults in this study. Um, their survival was better than the pre-frail, which is here in the middle line. And then the frail, of course, had the lowest survival over this period. And these uh, models were adjusted for uh, many factors that could account for um, death. So um, this type of um, survival analysis has, uh, was also replicated, or yes, replicated in many other studies. Uh, this phenotype now has been used uh, many, many times in many other studies and validated in other cohorts. Um, but also the phenotype is not only predictive of mortality, but also, as I mentioned, disability, falls, hospitalization, and other poor outcomes in older adults. Um, I, 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 of course, trained in the frailty phenotype model, um, and my research kind of has that model at the heart of it, I would say, but I, I would also, want to acknowledge um, that there is another model um, that I think is, I would say in the field um, being used about equally. And in fact, I over in the last five years or so, um, I would say a um, practice is to use both this frailty phenotype model from the freed model that I mentioned, but also to kind of add and complement that with um, a deficit accumulation frailty index model, which has been put forward by Ken Rockwood and colleagues. And it takes a little bit of a different conceptualization view of frailty and puts forward that frailty is uh, or can be um, defined by the measurement of an accumulation of deficits over time. And um, Whereas the freed phenotype model puts forward that frailty is sort of separate from disability and separate from comorbidity, uh, the frailty index kind of includes these all together as age-related deficits and accumulation of deficits and um, kind of puts them all in one index of these. And essentially, um, the, the, the specific items that are included in a deficit accumula accumulation model are not really um, necessarily so important as long as um, you cover a broad range of systems in your model. So in other words, it can't just be focused on neurologic deficits or cardiovascular deficits. It's also pretty uh, well established that you have you should have a minimum of 30 deficits in your index for it really to be predictive. And um, the, this model I think has a lot of power because whereas the freed phenotype model requires direct measurement of grip strength or gait speed, uh, the frailty index uh, really can allow you to pull data from the electronic medical record or even you know, existing trial data, or, and also is, um, is also used in animal models where you have a lot of data points that you could put into an index. And it's equally predictive of adverse health outcomes and mortality in older adults, and also has been applied very widely. So as I say, um, I, I've seen in recent years that it's, more or less practice to use both the frailty phenotype and the index. Um, so I, I, the, the definition to use for frailty has been a bit controversial over the years, um, but as I say, and more recently I see um, frailty researchers using both a phenotype model and a frailty index. 
Um, so I just wanted to briefly um, share with you some data from the San Antonio Longitudinal Study of Aging, um, which was a, or is a cohort study uh, here in San Antonio um, that was originally designed to look at predictors of disability in older adults. And um, this is a cohort that I worked with when I first came to San Antonio uh, with Helen Hazuda, who is the PI of the cohort. Um, and she at the time had a lot of the um, key characteristics for frailty, but ha it had not been classified. So we worked together to do that in the cohort. And this cohort is actually unique because it's by ethnic and it has um, equal proportions approximately of Mexican Americans and European Americans. Um, and just, you know, looking at the prevalence here, um, overall, the prevalence of frailty is about 9%. And you can see that it is higher in the Mexican American compared to the European Americans or non-Hispanic white. Um, and um, I'll, I believe I have a slide later that um, shows that this uh, is primarily related to other comorbid conditions um, in the Mexican American uh, population. Um, but uh, as a rule of thumb on average, um, about a 10% prevalence of frailty is seen in many studies. Of course, it varies uh, with what type of population that you're looking at. Um, and uh, we similarly found that um, mortality increased by frailty categories from non-frail, pre-frail to frail. And um, I probably could have skipped that slide and just show you our survival core curves, which are very similar to what was found in the Freed model, or sorry, the Freed paper. Um, and then in this uh, slide, I show you, as I alluded to, that um, we basically looked at the odds of being classified as frail by ethnic group. And it, you can see without any adjustment uh, for any other factors, um, you, ha you, have, you see about a 77 percent increase odds of frailty in Mexican Americans compared to European Americans. But then um, in a multivariate model where you add other factors like age, sex, um, socioeconomic status, et cetera, um, and diabetes, um, most importantly, you can see that this ethnic difference is no longer significant here on the top line. Um, but we do see that diabetes now is a major um, factor in the association between um, frailty and ethnic group here. And actually uh, this finding was early on, uh, started my thinking about the association of diabetes and frailty. And um, I have to say also that, you know, anecdotally in my older adult clinic population at the VA um, here at Audie Murphy VA Hospital. Um, <clears throat> we have such a high prevalence of diabetes here in South Texas, especially in older Mexican Americans, that it was just repeatedly seeing older um, veterans with diabetes having issues with frailty and disability. And I just became uh, very, very interested in this um, topic. Um, so looking at that a little bit more closely, um, you can see this is just, again, cross-sectional data, but if we're just comparing people who are frail um, here in this middle column with people who are not frail, again, this is from SALSA data, and you look at the um, difference in diabetes prevalence, um, you can see that about 41% of the individuals who are frail had diabetes compared to only about 18% in the non-frail uh, group here. And then uh, we also see a difference in waist circumference and body mass index. So um, the waist circumference is much higher in the frail uh, group compared to non-frail as is the BMI. And um, I don't go and show a lot of other papers, but there's been extensive um, prior papers and literature showing this association between obesity and frailty. And um, 
kind of contrary to the initial conceptualization of the frailty phenotype, which is, of course, um, that frailty was sort of a wasting syndrome. And in fact, unintentional weight loss is still, you know, was and is still one of the five components of frailty. Um, it's been reportedly show, repeatedly shown by others that um, obesity is um, highly associated and a predictive of frailty. Um, and given the, of course, the high prevalence of obesity in our uh, society, especially in older adults, I think this is much bigger uh, concern than um, underweight. And uh, Tiffany Cortez is a junior investigator who has a diversity supplement on my R01, who is looking into this a little bit more cl closely. Um, and she just showed in uh, some logistic regression analyses in the salsa cohort, looking at BMI as a predictor of future frailty over approximately six to seven years. Um, and this is in about 422 individuals, just showing that um, body mass index is a significant predictor of future frailty. Um, and then in the next slide, she looked at uh, waist circumference as a predictor and also shown to be um, predictor of future frailty. Um, and prior to uh, this, uh, one thing that uh, we wanted to look at was focusing on diabetes was kind of carrying on from that association that diabetes really sort of Partially, I mean, in, in, in addition to socioeconomic status complaint, uh, sorry, explained that association between um, frailty and ethnic group, we uh, wanted to look at uh, how, whether diabetes was a significant predictor of just gaining any one of the five frailty characteristics, not necessarily becoming overtly frail or crossing over from non-frail to frail, but sort of just gaining one or more of the five characteristics over time. And this again is in the salsa cohort with follow-up about six and a half years. And you can see that individuals who had diabetes were over two times more likely to gain any one frailty characteristic over this time period. Um, and this is you know, kind of an older paper, but um, this is just showing that um, there is a very strong association between diabetes and uh, muscle quality. Um, this is data from Health ABC. I believe, I, sorry, I, I cut out the introductory slide and I realized with that I cut out the citation, but I believe it's from 2006 or seven, um, just showing that uh, the, the longer duration of diabetes and the black bar, which is greater than six, uh, six years or more, um, have worse muscle quality uh, compared to no diabetes in the open bars. And in the middle with the hash bars is people who have diabetes for less than six years. And just showing that this association is pretty strong in both men and women in the leg and in the arm. And uh, they also showed this with regard to um, glycemic control. So in the open bars, these are individuals without diabetes and the black bars, it's people with diabetes with the A1C of 8% or more. And in the middle bar, um, those with kind of what we would consider well-controlled diabetes. And again, these are all in older adults, 70 or older. Um, so, you know, it's pretty well established that um, diabetes is detrimental um, to aging muscle. Um, and also, uh, also that uh, diabetes is an age-related disease. And um, this is just data showing the um, pr proportion of individuals with both diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes and showing how these rates really uh, climb fairly dramatically over decades or, or age categories, I should say. And in people 75 and older, uh, over a, a fifth of them have diabetes, another 15% or so have undiagnosed diabetes. And what this slide doesn't show um, 
is that of the people, the people not shown here with diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes, many of them, uh, some estimates suggest uh, 40 to even 45% uh, may have prediabetes or um, kind of early diabetes or um, um, I, by either impaired fasting glucose or oral glucose intolerance. So um, insulin resistance and uh, prediabetes and diabetes are huge uh, concerns for our older adults, along with, of course, obesity. Um, and so just to kind of focus, because this is the focus of the clinical trial that I'm going to share with you, is that I am conducting a clinical trial now of metformin um, for frailty prevention in older adults with prediabetes. So um, hopefully just to kind of convince you that um, even in the absence of diabetes, insulin resistance is a significant issue. Um, this is uh, data from N. Haynes, where they looked at um, quartiles of insulin resistance using the HOMA IR, which um, is sort of a proxy measure without having to do an invasive kind of insulin clamp, which is really the gold standard for insulin resistance, but is obviously hard to do on a larger scale. But this is just showing the gate speed, to, um, uh, which is lower in individuals with high insulin resistance. This is cross-sectional. Um, and in uh, regression models, they showed that each standard deviation increase in the HOMA IR was associated with about 0.04 second uh, lower gait speed. Um, and this was a sig interestingly significant in men, but not significant in women um, in this particular study. Um, and then in the study of the osteoporotic fractures in men, um, published in 2011, uh, they sh showed that um, insulin resistance, again, looking at quartiles, was predictor predictive of decline in appendicular lean mass over about three years. So um, in this case, quartile one and two kind of had a similar decline of a little bit over 2.5. Um, and in court, people with the quartiles of three or four, this is percent change, had about a 3.5% reduction in appendicular lean mass. Um, and then also in the, this um, Mr. Oz study, which is the acronym, um, they looked at sort of change in appendicular lean mass over time and what was the effect of different classes of glycemia, as well as whether um, the patients were treated with, or participants were treated with different types of uh, diabetes med medications, specifically insulin sensitizers. So they looked at a little over, or almost 4,000 older men, age 65 and older, uh, by baseline glycemic status, and looked at change in appendicular lean mass over that period of time. And uh, you can see that the greatest um, decline in appendicular lean mass occurred here in the middle in the untreated diabetes category um, with a negative 4.2%. Um, um, and then di diabetes who, patients with diabetes who were treated with insulin sensitizers had a decline of about 1.8%, which actually was uh, less decline than those who were normal glycemic who had a decline of 3%. And people with diabetes who were treated but not with insulin sensitizers, so could have been sulfonylureas or insulin, their decline was the greatest of 4.4% decline. So um, this I think kind of shows that even in the face of um, insulin resistance and diabetes, that potentially insulin sensitizers can be beneficial uh, in these type of population, which is of course really uh, prevalent in the older adults as I showed. Um, and uh, this is also data showing that um, 
sarcopenia and obesity, obesity are risk factors for um, frailty and disability and disability not only in, well, activities of daily living, but instrumental activities of daily living. So um, this is just showing, and I'm sorry, I don't have the number of individuals here, but just showing um, the impact of obesity alone low muscle mass alone or the combination of sarcopenic obesity. And just looking at this top um, here, top uh, portion of the table, um, you can see that sarcopenic obesity as well as low lean mass were predictive of future frailty. Um, and then also uh, ADL disability and IADL disability over approximately five years of follow-up. Um, and then uh, the Bar Barsley and others, I believe from Hopkins, showed that insulin resistance is predictive of future frailty as well over about 10 years of follow-up. So for each one point increase in the HOMA IR, you had about a 15% increased risk of future frailty. And they also found an association with um, inflammation that um, with each uh, point increase in C-reactive protein, you had also an increase um, in the risk of frailty. So uh, this brings me to kind of the conceptual model for the clinical trial that I'm currently conducting, uh, which is that aging and prediabetes or insulin resistance, um, it leads to uh, inflammation and insulin resistance. And I didn't go into just by through it because of time issues, I really didn't go into a lot related to inflammation, but um, many have shown that frailty is highly correlated with inflammation. Um, and we also have some data looking at uh, serum markers of inflammation uh, from older adults here in San Antonio showing a high correlation, uh, but that's been extensively shown. But basically the conceptual model is that inflammation and insulin resistance um, are key players in the development of frailty. And these are, um, I guess, kind of upregulated with aging and prediabetes and uh, that metformin is potentially a treatment to um, either delay or prevent the onset of frailty. Um, so kind of turning to metformin, um, it's a, there are a, so animal models showing that metformin extends lifespan in C. elegans in mice um, and improves physical function, exercise tolerance, um, and kind of locomotor activity. Um, although some of these studies are, uh, I, are a bit, there are some studies that show no difference as well, but there are some that do show extension of lifespan in rodents. And then there are lots of observational studies showing the potential value of metformin in preventing the onset of many age-related diseases like cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and uh, we have also some data in frailty. So um, metformin is um, in the aging field and in the geroscience field, which is sort of a newer uh, field of research, um, kind of, I would say, a candidate uh, agent for um, improvement in health span. And um, there are a lot of studies looking at metformin, but of course, there are other agents being actively um, investigated for health span uh, improvement for aging. So it's not the only, but it is definitely gained a lot of interest in, I would say, probably five, 10 years, last five, 10, 10 years. Um, we uh, published a few years ago um, some data in the VA cohort. Um, national cohort data uh, looking at the potential of metformin for reduction in mortality and frailty in older veterans with diabetes. And I 
uh, we did this work in collaboration with Chen Pin Wang, who's a very accomplished uh, biostatistician um, who works with me now on, on the clinical trial as well. But um, she really led the study and I, I mean, gave some input with regards to frailty. Um, but essentially this was a um, secondary data analysis uh, looking at veterans over the age of 65 with type two diabetes who did not have liver renal diseases or other major illnesses like, like such as cancer. And we looked at individuals who were treated with metformin or sulfonylurea monotherapy, no insulin use for at least 180 days. And I uh, used Cox proportional hazard model to examine um, survival and also frailty by use of metformin with sulfonylurea as the comparison. And um, you can see that um, uh, frailty as well as mortality were reduced with metformin compared to sulfonylurea by about 30% or a um, little more than 30% in both cases. Um, and uh, this was um, done in about a little over 2,000 older veterans. And at the time, um, use of the frailty index wasn't um, super uh, prevalent. So we actually kind of used uh, a differing definition of um, ICD-10, or at the time it was actually ICD-9 codes that are um, diagnoses that are associated, known to be associated with frailty. Um, in fact, we probably should um, replicate this now with the frailty index, which is more widely used. But, but essentially there's some, um, preliminary data to suggest that metformin is helpful for frailty prevention and um, also re reducing mortality. So now I just want to kind of give you a little bit more detail about the um, clinical trial. Um, so this is uh, funded by NIA and um, actually we have just finally, uh, we're just about to complete enrollment for this trial. Um, uh, given the prevalence of uh, pre-diabetes, it wasn't super difficult, but we are include, so our inclusion criteria, I should say that first, is 65 and older, not frail already, community dwelling older adult who have impaired glucose tolerance. So people who have pre-diabetes and we base that on um, the oral glucose tolerance test and really kind of, um, took um, a page from the DPP study where they also um, based their pre-diabetes entry criteria on the oral glucose tolerance test. And um, it's a randomized double blind placebo control trial of metformin. Um, and we follow participants over 24 months. Um, we uh, are taking a lot of um, measures, which I'll show in the next slide, of, um, plasma, um, skeletal muscle, uh, et cetera, to look at the mechanisms that I kind of described in the conceptual model. Uh, we titrate the drug um, to a maximum tolerated dose up to 2000 milligrams per day. And again, it's treatment for 24 months. And then of course we're following uh, their frailty status as well as many other assessments. Um, so this is just a snapshot of the outcomes. Primarily, we're focused on frailty, the phenotype, and actually I should have added here also the frailty index is now a primary outcome that we um, added early on in the study uh, prior to uh, enrollment um, at the, actually at the suggestion of our DSMB, which I think it was a good suggestion. And um, secondary outcomes are several, so looking at gait speed, grip strength, lower extremity strength using um, um, a lower extremity measurement, um, biodex machine, um, short physical performance battery, six minute walk, and several measures of inflammation in uh, plasma as well as um, skeletal muscle. We do muscle biopsy at baseline year one and year two at the end of study. And we'll be looking at insulin signaling in the muscle 
looking at some of these mechanisms. Um, as we know that metformin um, is an active, is an AMPK activator, um, but we'll be looking also at mTOR signaling as well, and these also here. Uh, we're also looking at body composition and uh, measures of glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. Um, we had been doing insulin clamp until the pandemic. Um, and um, the impact of the pandemic, we did have to, for approximately about a month, kind of stop in-person um, visits, but we were able to maintain um, the drug by mailing the drug to people's homes. Um, we were able to maintain safety assessments by setting up a contract with, um, you know, a outside lab that patients can travel to close to their home to get the labs as opposed to coming into the clinical research unit, because I'm sure uh, many of you ha had to also deal with the research units shutting down for a period of time. But in any event, we were able to keep the study going. But um, w during the pandemic and after the pandemic, due to the fact that the insulin clamp is a fairly extensive procedure, um, it takes approximately three to four hours. We, um, we, we stopped doing that, um, and, but uh, at least half of the participants have the insulin clamp throughout the whole study. Um, but we continue with the oral glucose tolerance test, which we do every six months throughout the study. Um, so for this particular trial, we're kind of focusing on the effect of metformin on insulin sensitivity, inflammation, and kind of AMPK activation. Um, but as it's hypothesized that metformin could have many other potential effects kind of targeting different mechanisms in age that are important for aging or pillars of aging. Um, so we actually propose a sec secondary um, study uh, that was funded. And I, I worked very closely with Nick Musi, who's our bar shop director and also uh, PI of our Pepper Center um, to propose uh, with a sort of a secondary or ancillary study, I should say, looking at uh, markers of cellular senescence, mitochondrial function and epigenetic clock or um, epigenetic modifications. Um, so we are also doing these. Um, so with regards to the mitochondrial function, we're using Ouroboros. So when the patients come for muscle biopsy, we store some of the tissue for these other assays. Um, uh, but of course we take fresh tissue to do the mitochondrial um, assay in, in the Ouroboros here in the lab. Um, we're also, I didn't mention, um, fixing the tissue so we can eventually look at cross-sectional area of the muscle fibers um, and histological examination in the future. Um, so uh, I wanna keep time, oh gosh, I'm, I'm talking too much. I, so I, I'm gonna try to rush, maybe not rush too much, but I, I don't, I, I'm kind of going slower than I wanted to, but um, I do wanna point out that um, recently it was published um, in the Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study. Um, I mentioned that frailty is now being um, examined in a lot of kind of trial cohorts. And there was a recent publication by my mentor, Helen Hazuda, looking at the effect of uh, metformin compared to intensive lifestyle intervention in the DPPOS study. Um, and uh, this is probably, um, you know, pr probably the audience is familiar with the study, but it's a randomized controlled trial of metformin lifestyle intervention and placebo for prevention of diabetes. Um, they, they, of course, found that um, metformin was um, reduced diabetes by about 30%, lifestyle actually more effective by 55%. And in fact, the older adults were more responsive to lifestyle um, than they were to metformin, but they were still responsive to metformin. 
um, uh, that point is actually a bit controversial, but um, uh, older adults were still as responsive to metformin as younger adults, but more responsive to lifestyle intervention. Um, after the intervention phase, all patients received the lifestyle intervention, and then the metformin group remained on open label metformin. And so this study uh, went into longitudinal follow up. Um, and for this particular analysis, they uh, looked at um, frailty over the long term over about 12 to 14 years after randomization. So if you look at the um, kind of raw data, uh, there was no significant difference in the treatment groups uh, uh, among the treatment groups for frailty prevalence at year eight or year three. Um, but it, it, is, it does appear to be lower, although it wasn't significant in the lifestyle group compared to metformin and placebo. And there was no um, difference between metformin groups and placebo groups. Um, but looking at um, kind of data from years eight and 10, pooled data from those years and using generalized estimating equations to kind of um, use that data as repeated measures, uh, they did find a benefit uh, for lifestyle compared to metformin and also uh, lifestyle compared to placebo. Um, actually, the um, lifestyle compared to placebo was significant and there was no difference between metformin and placebo. So, um, you know, not great evidence for, uh, for, to support the clinical trial that we're doing, but uh, of course this um, was done several years after, oops, sorry, went backwards, several years after the initial randomization and also frailty was not um, assessed at baseline. Um, the other, I guess, I would say caveat to this study is that these individuals were not older at the start of the study. They were <clears throat> kind of middle-aged, um, but this group is, this, this cohort is now aging and are kind of reaching a point where they are kind of 75, 80 years of age and will be um, kind of starting to have more aging or geriatric syndromes. And I believe that um, since I, work with Helen Hazuda that they will be looking at frailty in future um, analyses in this study going forward. Um, uh, I'm trying to decide in the interest of time if I should kind of skip through, I think I'll skip through um, this, but suffice it to say, we recently looked at um, frailty in the look ahead trial um, and we found no difference in the frailty phenotype. Um, and in the look ahead trial, which was a clinical trial of lifestyle intervention in patients with diabetes. Um, so there was no, again, a ca caveat to this study, similar to the DPPOS, PPOS trial, is that frailty was also not measured at the baseline of this study, um, the frailty phenotype. But I do want to show um, this, this slide because this was um, published in about a year ago by, I believe Simpson was the first author looking at the frailty index in the look ahead trial. And this study is important, I think, because as I mentioned at the start of the study, um, with the frailty index, if you have um, data points or, or measures from a broad range of systems, and at least 30 items, you can construct the frailty index. So using the frailty index, they were able to account for the fact that frailty, the phenotype wasn't measured at the baseline of the study. So you can see then here, they did show, um, this is the look ahead trial um, at the baseline, you know, point zero and over eight years, and they showed uh, very nicely that the frailty index does decline with the lifestyle intervention in these patients with diabetes. Um, but kind of over long-term follow-up does kind of, you know, I guess that improvement wanes and 
gets very close to the um, placebo group. And um, so I think that the takeaway or potential takeaway is that um, lifestyle intervention can be effective, but the effects may not be very lasting. Um, and uh, I just show here that, you know, those, that dip in the frailty index kind of um, goes along with the change in body weight, which is if you look at, um, and the hemoglobin A1C, which is um, the, so if you just for, for to, to orient you to the slide, this is also look ahead data. If you're just looking at the blue and the black line. So the blue line here is um, uh, the, the sort of, not really placebo, but they were sort of the basic diabetes education group um, uh, or the control. And then the black line is the lifestyle intervention group. And you can see that the weight loss declines uh, oh, very nicely with the intervention as does hemoglobin A1C, but then over a long period, follow, long follow-up, these um, improvements do wane. Um, I'm gonna skip through this, which was a pilot study by one of our uh, Pepper scholars, just showing um, short-term benefit of lifestyle intervention on the free phenotype. Um, but I just did wanna turn now to show you that um, this is, uh, data uh, from Dennis Villarreal's very nice New England Journal paper um, showing the um, changes in different um, physical function with weight loss in older adults with um, obesity. And I just want to kind of show that um, even in here in panel C at the bottom left, that um, with weight loss, although we know that we lose fat mass, there's also loss of lean mass in, especially in older adults, which can be detrimental to older adults who are already having age-related sarcopenia. So um, this clinical trial uh, randomized older adults to aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, or a combination, and, um, or a control group. And you can see that, um, all individuals were also, uh, they also underwent weight loss. So they all lost some lean mass, but um, there was a um, amelioration of that lean mass loss in individuals who had some type of resistance exercise. So uh, right now the mainstay um, or the recommended treatment for sarcopenic obesity to, um, for older adults really is um, weight loss combined with resistance exercise. Uh, however, it is controversial because we don't want to exacerbate the sarcopenia. Um, and I would, I, I really think that this is an area that needs to be in, uh, researched in the future so uh, we can potentially find interventions to improve this. Um, and so I will try to, in the last couple of minutes, just give you some pilot data, but you can also um, read, uh, we, we recently published uh, a pilot study of intranasal oxytocin for sarcopenic obesity. So um, oxytocin is a uh, hormone produced by the posterior pituitary um, that obviously is very involved in um, childbearing and lactation, um, but it, it is continued to be produced throughout the lifespan and actually declines the circulating levels and actually CSFX levels also decline with age. Um, and the kind of the relevance of oxytocin in non-pregnant or non-lactating women and uh, men is not really actually clear. But in the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot of data showing that oxytocin regulates feeding and metabolism. And there's been uh, rodent data as well as some small human studies showing that um, oxytocin use reduces body weight, um, waist circumference and cholesterol. And there's some evidence showing that it um, has effect on satellite 
uh, cells in the muscle tissue and can improve muscle regeneration after injury. Um, uh, and I should say that uh, it, so it's being investigated with regards to kind of metabolism and obesity, but there are also people looking at the role of oxytocin for other things like um, autism, for example, to improve social engagement behavior. Um, but we um, in San Antonio, in collaboration with Elena Volpe at UT Galveston and Jessica Lee at UT Houston, undertook, a, and also Nick Moosey uh, here in San Antonio worked with uh, me as well on this study. Uh, we undertook a pilot trial of intranasal oxytocin, um, which is delivered by a nasal spray um, in 21 older adults with obesity and slow gait speed. Um, and we found a um, improvement in lean mass in the oxytocin group. Um, and uh, compared to placebo, and also we found improvement in the LDL cholesterol or reduction in LDL cholesterol in the oxytocin group compared to placebo. And um, again, it was a small study, um, but I guess it was more of proof of concept. And we are, um, we've submitted an R01 application to do a larger trial of this, so we shall see. Okay, so. Um, I'll just go ahead and summarize and, and basically um, say that obesity and insulin resistance are uh, major issues for older adults and increase uh, frailty risk. Metformin is potentially a treatment to reduce frailty and um, that uh, novel interventions, not only by uh, you know, our group here, but many others are needed to um, improve physical function and health span in older adults. Um, and, you know, this is a very exciting uh, area of research to be engaged in. And I just put a plug in for our Pepper Center um, and our website is there if people want to take a look at the um, investigations what we're doing in this area. And then I will stop there and take any questions. And I thank you for your attention. Sorry if I went a little over. So should I read the comments or? Uh, Saidas Sai is gonna ask the questions. Oh, She's okay, great. Sorry about that, my mute function didn't unmute. Um, thank you again, Dr. Espinosa for this wonderful, interesting talk. Thank Your um, first question that we have is, how well is the chicken and egg question answered in this field? Um, and does diabetes lead to frailty or does frailty lead to diabetes? The answer might have relevance as to what to expect from your metformin intervention. Yeah, that is actually a very, uh, I think a really good point. And in fact, <clears throat> when I started on this study, uh, Nick Moosey actually posed that question to me. <laughs> and um, I don't think that that's been elucidated, but it, if you look in the field, there have been some papers kind of postulating that um, frailty can lead to diabetes. And I have to say anecdotally, although I'm blinded and I don't know, but we are um, obviously in the clinical trial that I'm doing, it's people who are pre-diabetic. So some of these patients will um, develop diabetes during the course of the trial and about 10% of the individuals have. But um, anecdotally, I have noticed that, and kind of contrary to what I would have hypothesized, it's not necessarily the obese individuals, it's sort of the more frailer appearing people that are developing diabetes in the course of the trial. Um, and so I, you know, at the start of this, I thought very clearly insulin resistance leads to frailty. But now I am honestly not so sure. I do think that there is an interplay and potentially um, maybe it's not frailty so much, but sarcopenia leads to the onset of diabetes. And um, in fact, um, Tiffany Cortez is a mentee of ours and she's uh, an endocrinologist and 
She's undertaking some secondary data analysis um, in the VA data to try to try to understand that a little bit, but I think that's a very important question. Absolutely. So yeah, that response sort of indicates that there's work to be done, but there's a question that's sort of related by what mechanism is insulin resistance related to disease and is there a specific role for altered glucose in disease in non-diabetic? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, what is I, the mechanism, um, you know, what by what mechanism is insulin resistance related to disease and is there a specific role for altered glucose in disease in non-diabetic? Um, yeah, I, so I think, um, essentially even in non-diabetics, sort of the degree of insulin resistance, um, and, you know, there's so many factors at play there, but, um, you know, the, how that ties in with inflammation and also kind of insulin signaling in the muscle, like AMPK activation. So that would be the hypothesis. And that's sort of how we hypothesize that metformin would improve these by um, improving AMPK activation and reducing inflammation directly in the muscle. Um, so those are the mechanisms we're targeting with the trial. But as I said, we're going to be also looking at uh, measures of cellular senescence and mitochondrial function. Great. Thank you. Uh, another couple of quick questions. What is the definition of muscle quality from your the earlier studies that you reported in the first half of the talk? And, and was that data biopsy generated? Oh, yes. So the muscle quality, um, I am pretty sure it was um, from DEXA and the exact definition, I, I can't exactly tell you, but I, I believe it was strength over um, lean mass through DEXA. Uh, I don't think it was a uh, bioimpedance. Is that what it was asking? Biopsy, biopsy didn't. Oh, yeah, no, it was not. It was not biopsy data. Um, this was larger scale studies. So they were using primarily DEXA. Great. Thank you. Um, and there's another question that asks, have you investigated dietary intake and or physical activity as the underlying factors for insulin resistance? Uh, no, we haven't. That's a very good question. I have um, had kind of partially through the trial thought, gosh, I really should be doing like a um, more thorough dietary history, which I'm not, sadly. Um, you know, you always have the um, issue of burden on the participants. So they're already undergoing so much. So I have not added that, but I think that that is something that would be a very interesting. All right, thank you. And the last question, please comment on the safety of using metformin. Yes, um, so there's you know, been, I think, a lot of concern about it, uh, but so far, I'm, I mean, of course you wanna make sure that the person has normal uh, re renal function. And so, but actually since I started this study, the um, parameters for use of metformin in kind of uh, chronic kidney disease were have been relaxed a bit. So it used to be kind of based on more or less uh, creatinine, but now we go on GFR. And so in my, in my hands, it, both clinically and research, it's very safe. Um, we just, uh, we don't start anyone on the study with a GFR less than 45, and we monitor their uh, renal function every three months in the study. And we have certain parameters in place for kind of holding the, me the medication. Of course, if anyone is hospitalized for any reason or is going to have a, a study with dye, that we hold the medication. Um, but I have found it to be very safe. Now, there is some patients do have um, gastrointestinal side effects, which is fairly common, but I have only had, I want to say one or two people that were not able to tolerate the medication at all. And were not able to continue in the study out of, um, about 140 some people that have been randomized so far. So, um, I would say it's very well tolerated and safe. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and engagement with the questions. Uh, we look forward to all the publications from all the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.
I appreciate it. Thank you.